Well, howdy, good afternoon. Uh, so with my program, we're gonna tell you a little bit different level from what we heard this morning to a little bit more focused on the individual organization or landowner and what they can do for what I call market-based conservation. How to make money while conserving the, the land, the wetland the habitat that you want. And so that's essentially what I do across the state is help ranchers primarily because that's who has the wildlife resource in private lands more than farmers in our state. We have more industrial farms than, than say in the Northeast where agritourism, but we have a lot of that also. And then organizations, cities, I work with big cities on how they can capitalize on nature-based tourism. And then individual travelers, how they, what's out there to do and some skills development, although it's a smaller part of what we do. So I got a couple of goals for you today and then on the simple level I want you to come away with three things. One, to know how we use the term nature tourism, kind of what that means for us, for AgriLife Extension. Uh, big, just to know that there is a program for nature based tourism at AgriLife Extension. There's free help available for any organization or individual that wants it. Um, we have no regulatory role. so. We can't uh, do anything in that regards. We're all there to just try to provide information and training. And then the source here, the, the website, naturetourism.tamu.edu. But the key thing for us on terms, and I use it, work with a lot of people, everyone has a different lens or when you hear the term nature, wildlife, tourism, money, <laughs> conservation, all whether they're good or bad. So if you find hunting.tamu.edu, same place. Fishing, same place. Agritourism, same place. Adventure.tamu.edu, all come to the same place because we use all those terms to provide help. They're different in the marketplace, they're different for what people are doing specifically, but the process and a lot of the information is the same and the resources available to the people doing it are similar. So all that is included in how we define it. And agritourism, if you haven't heard that term, agricultural tourism, essentially experiences based on crops and livestock or agricultural lifestyles. So pick your own fruit, Christmas tree farms, corn mazes, pumpkin patch, hay rides, farm stays, all that. Agritourism, but it's kind of lumped in together with what we do. Nature tourism, you know, fishing and hunting, people pretty much understand. Uh, nature tourism, or the other category, adventure is pretty much everything else. If it brings people to your site, your property, it's kind of folded in there. And so I'm going to run through some examples and a few other terms, but if you get those two things, really, that there is a program at Extension, we can help. Go to naturetourism.tamu if you get that, that's good today. I hope to learn a little more, but um, the final part of that piece that you really should go away with is yes, there is a market for this thing called nature tourism. There's money, there's a market for it. How to capture that is the whole process and that's what I help people with. So one thing that's changed, and even if you've tried some of this in the past and, and, you had, and it did or didn't work, things are changing fast and mostly due to human population growth. It's, if you haven't realized, we turned urban as a world, meaning more people live in cities than in rural areas just a few years ago. Texas population has doubled. In my lifetime, the world's population more than doubled. So just supply and demand, there's more people. Everybody wants outdoor experiences, recreation, good times at some level, but there's less of it. Bottom line, there's less wild animals, there's less dark spaces, there's less quiet spaces, and there's less access to it. And so when you have it, or you can develop it in a different meaning for the word develop, develop a natural resource, you have an added value. There's a whole lot of value there now in terms of dollars and access to those dollars that maybe wasn't there even 10 years ago. This number I think you should know, wildlife recreation impact in Texas alone, the impact is valued at over $15 billion. That's hunting, fishing, and looking at animals. And when we look at that, that's about, eight point, that's about eight billion spending directly, and then the impact of that in addition from the respending. This, this is based on a five year, every five years done by US Fish and Wildlife Study. A lot of detail in that, it's available online if you want it. This does not include nature. And when I say that, and I separate nature and wildlife only in the sense that wildlife is of course part of nature, but we're when we're talking about experience and selling and experience, think about your own trips. 
uh, what you go to do if you do outdoor <laughs> recreation. If you're here, you might. Um, <clears throat> but if you go to the beach, that's a nature experience. If you get a cabin on the lake, it's nature. If you go hiking in the mountains, it's nature. If you go hunting, fishing, bird watching, it's wildlife. And those are different markets. They sell to different people, they sell for different prices. The mo point of exchange on money and what people buy are different. One example is almost every experience you do, tourism, what do you pay most for? It's the plane ticket or the hotel. Meaning you're paying for a place to stay and then you find something to do. The one except, or the rare exception to that, a lot of hunting operators, people pay for the hunt and the amenity like lodging is included sometimes. Whereas the other way, at the beach you pay for the hotel but the beach is included for free. So sometimes these can be mixed and if we misunderstand that, you can have the right product and the right market and still not have a connection. So we're sometimes just using what we have in a new way. Uh, that happens a lot. Riverfront property, I see it misused all the time. Waterfront, old resources, and most importantly, your local culture and local wildlife or landscape features are undervalued consistently. A few examples of pricing. Uh, I think I talk a lot to ranchers, so I say, well, what does it take to equal a sale of a calf? But if you look, $675 for a weekend for a cabin at this place, and this would be nature, just gives a sense, well, you, obviously you have a limited number of weekends, but it gives a sense of what we're doing. Um, and even $40 for your pet, so your dog wants to go on vacation too. On the other hand, you look at what takes to get a value. You want value-based pricing. We won't get into a lot of pricing techniques, but if you look at what people are willing to pay for, if you think of any experience of recreational, how many people, well, I won't get into too many questions here, but I don't know if you've priced deer hunts. Uh, if you Pat, want to do a trophy deer hunt, one of the top places in the world to go is the King Ranch in South Texas. But if you want a 200-inch deer plus, that's $25,000 for a single hunt. That's the inches of antler total. That's how they score and individualize them. So what else does somebody pay $25,000 for a couple day experience? Almost nothing. Other side, five private family ranch, Natural Bridge Caverns. Um, we get away, it's not a per acre revenue operation when you think tourism. So if you're thinking of conserving five acres, 100 acres, 100,000 acre wetland conservation, you only maybe need a couple acres to set people's feet on the ground at least the vast majority of people. So this is a more than 1,000 acre ranch, family business, discovered a cave in the 60s by letting some cavers on, developed it really well, more than 300,000 visitors a year, multi-million dollar business, all on less than 40 acres. The rest of it's completely operated privately, any way they want, wildlife, no visitors on it. So you don't have to use every acre to benefit from tourism, but you benefit, the guest benefits from the experience, you have the landscape, you have the wildlife, you have the silence, the quiet, all that's part of the experience, the viewscape or the sense of place that you get being outside with that space around you, you just don't have to necessarily step on it. Another example, events, ranch up near Salado, good location, not everything has to be done on site, but this guy just built two big buildings, he can host weddings, and he's got a nice little rock creek, built a little chapel area there, all he does is rent the facility out for about 3,000 a weekend, two to 3,000 a weekend, sold every weekend for people to do their weddings. He just rents the space. It's $400,000 revenue. He doesn't do any of the wedding operations, just rents the space. So we're changing what we can do with ag, and because agricultural landowners are who owns the most. Anybody know the percentage of ag land in Texas? It's about 78% of all Texas is in ag. So we're looking at that, that's where 94 to 97, how you count it is private land in Texas. So we're, that's, that's who owns the private land essentially. So we're looking at changes, the markets are changing for them, how they're dealing with changes in, in cattle and other prices, but the droughts, those things affect it. So we look at diversification, including tourism. And hunting is tourism, although a lot of people don't label those two together. And so we're trying to do that. But it changes a little bit. You don't have to take whatever's being the price at the sale barn if you're more creative and can sell directly to the consumer. And this can be a nonprofit organization or a nature center or a county government or whoever's managing the facility, you know, same thoughts. 
This just to show to going from cattle to hunting blind in the background kind of diversification. And those things can be compatible. They don't have to be exclusive. So we're thinking, what does it take to provide a quality experience? This is what people miss sometimes. Well, I got something. <laughs> um, but basically, blend, the message I really want to get is blending culture and wildlife and your basic needs of everybody, place to eat, sleep, and a bathroom, really, and feel somewhat safe. Uh, if you get that, then you can have a product. With wildlife tourism, nature tourism, you have to know people. You have to manage for people, but you also have to manage for the wildlife to have a product and the nature if that's it. You have to know what matters. Does it matter if you have a telephone line going through a place? Does it degrade the value of the experience or not? So you bury it or not? Something like that. A lot of times those skill sets are not in the same person or even the same organization. So it's really important to evaluate where you want to spend your time, your time, and then find the right partner that can do the other half or other piece of that. And we can help put those together. There are people, outfitters or the other side, um, the wildlife managers or whoever. They don't always, even in the same family, I work with people that brothers, you know, one guy wants nothing to do with guests, but he'll manage the property. The other, that's all he wants to do. He doesn't want to do the traditional stuff. So I didn't find men and women in the family side also have a different perspective on how they manage things and where they fall. Um, in general, I found the women are much more interested in the marketing side than the guys are. Once they're on site, the guys really get involved. I like this quote, success is not an accident. Uh, just a little different than pretty much every other work, maybe a little more advertising. I like to put to Ted Turner. So real simple summary, if you take like a planning process, this is <laughs> extremely simplified, right? Three steps, three eyes. First, inventory what you have in whatever project site or property you're working with. And natural features, uh, tourism services, how do people interact with it, how many people, at what time of year, and really what gets overlooked is what's the potential for restoring wildlife habitat. And one of the big ones is riparian zones, wetland areas. They can provide a whole lot of wildlife and recreation for a small, relatively small investment, um, especially because in ag and other uses, a lot of times those are the problem areas. They're less productive in some cases or they're more problematic for, for uh, structural development. And so if, with a little thought, they actually be, can become a greater revenue source rather than a, a challenge. Interpretation is a second eye, and really that means telling your stories, telling people why you're special, why you love your place. And that's the biggest message you can get across. If you love this resource, sharing why you love it, a personal lets people connect to it, then they'll feel like they want to experience it or at least send, buy a coupon for someone else that they think likes the outdoors. Um, <clears throat> so sharing that story, we do training to help people learn how to do interpretation face to face and then that carries over too into your word of mouth marketing. The biggest message there in anything you're doing though, and then I see the communities overdo this a lot, but individuals and businesses do it, but is under promise. Don't oversell what you have. Okay, you don't have everything for everyone. You don't even have something for everyone. So don't say that. Just pick who your really primary target is, what's your brand, and under promise and then over deliver a little more than what you said. Because that word of mouth will build in any relatively small operation. And, and small gets pretty big. I mean, unless you're doing millions of visitors that only do it one time, your word of mouth is going to matter. And now with social media, it even matters for them. Um, and then integrate. Make it easier for people to, for the hardcore people that want to spend all day, all week, all month out there camping, you know, with no toilets, to the people who just want an hour or two experience in the middle of the day. Those are different experiences. They want different things. They're going to engage differently. And even the same person who wants both of those may not want both on the same day, same trip, same group. So blend where they're eating, where they're sleeping, what are they buying, you know, all those comfort things. And, and just because one day you don't want to deal with mosquitoes doesn't mean that same person won't do it later. Um, and this is a, your local resource. Everybody know this? Why don't polar bears eat penguins? Not everybody knows this. They live literally on other ends of the earth. It's not because they don't like the taste or they can't catch them. It's because they don't live together. They never know each other exists. But that's because if you lived there, you would maybe know that. 
but we don't necessarily know that, especially if you watch Coca-Cola commercials. So <laughs> you, you want to understand that what you have locally is probably different, like what we have in Texas is different than California and New York. So, but it's local, common here. So really, really common things can become your bread and butter product if you just share them with people and share why you care about them. Quickly, while the numbers nationally, 45 billion in looking at animals, 42 billion fishing, 23 billion hunting, those numbers are a little different scale in Texas, but essentially that's all the money spent on equipment, travel, feed, things like that. Um, so there's just a lot more people involved in viewing than, than hunting, but the per person expenditure for hunting or fishing <laughs> is way higher than the viewer. So on a per person basis, it's a lot easier to connect to the hunting market, to the fishermen, than the nature church, because that encompasses a bunch of things in a different way. It's just, it's a harder market to sell to, but it's there. This uh, Santa Ana, anybody been there? National Wildlife Refuge, right on the border in South Texas. So you're looking at a, a, a refuge, and I call this what we want as an example of development. This is not an undeveloped place. It's a wildlife refuge, but it was developed for wildlife. It was more than that, it was developed for people to experience wildlife. So you have, it's highly managed for wildlife, and it has a parking lot, has a bathroom, and it has some trails, and it even has someone who people respect their authority on wildlife there. They don't have a lot of interpretive programs, but they have that facility. And they get a quarter million visitors to a quote, undeveloped lot. And generating, this is an old number, but over $5 million for that local community. So there's money there and people want this if you get it. State parks a few years ago, and into the study, but the communities, not the state parks themselves, but because there's a state park in the community, local businesses generated a lot of money because people are traveling there and they're spending in addition. I won't go through a lot of this, but target your market, not just everybody. If you didn't take marketing courses, you'll hear the P's of marketing, but really know and define your product, how it solves a problem for your guest. Place of sale, where are people gonna buy? Make it easy to buy, and right now that means sell it online in addition to wherever you are. Promotion, tie into other things that are going on, other organizations, and try to uh, partner. And price, basically don't try to have a low price. If it's low, and I think nonprofits screw this up a lot because their, their mission, and I'm kind of being overly blunt with saying screw it up because they're trying to do really good things, but I think they self they, they don't meet their own goals sometimes because they undervalue what they're doing. And in the sense that <clears throat> if something's cheap, people think it's not very good. And in the, if you're trying to reach a lot of people, you think if it's cheaper, that means a lot more people will experience it. That's not always the case. If you look at it, if anybody here want to stay in a $19 a night hotel, you know what that probably means if you could find one or even a $40 or $50 a night hotel in downtown Houston? Is that gonna be a fun experience? Okay? You know, because you're not gonna go there. They're not gonna get very many visitors. Because, <laughs> so you look at occupancy rates, the cheapest hotels don't have the highest occupancy rates. And that means how many of the available nights are sold. Because people want a good experience and most, if they have the ability, they're gonna pay for it. So. When you do things to reach a lot of people, you gotta blend which things are cheap, free, which, which things you really need, the re if you need that revenue to operate. Um, but even if all your goal is to reach more people, you might reach more people by having a higher price. And I'll give a great marketing class example for me. It was a, this was a perfume case study. Okay, so it's a little different. But they marketed, everybody loved it, smelled great, put it on the market. They wanted to get into the market quickly. So at a low entry price, which is a strategy, you know, easy market entry, get market share, didn't sell very well. So somebody was smart, they realized what people are looking at perfumes and there's a lot of other products, fashion, other things, value to price. It can't be good if it's cheap. They tripled the price, it sold great, same product. Okay, so just think of the value of this outdoor experience and the wildlife 
You don't have to charge everybody that, but you need to be aware there's value there. How are you special? Really have to know how you're the best experience of whatever else you're offering. If you can't honestly say you're best for this particular experience, then why would anyone pick you? Because they'll pick the other one if they know about it. So figure out how you're best. Uh, some of the tools we have to help you do this, we have an online enterprise planning tool, and this can work for a park, I mean a state park, it can work for an individual landowner, business, or nature center uh, on your activity or product, whether you're really going to charge a fee or not, but it helps organize the activity and the planning and what it would cost. And we've kind of transitioned this from a publication to an online tool. It's a very basic business or operation enterprise planning tool, and it's free. And then uh, I won't get into it much, but we're just now kind of unveiling and launching an online uh, wildlife guide training program, which will be supplemented with live workshops. And right now, the, it, there's two versions. There's a statewide, and then there will be 10 local regional to, to look at local wildlife. And uh, I won't get into that. This is a free financial planning tool. Some of the process of going through selecting your product and market you kind of, it's a little bit of an experiment always. You always kind of adjust who you're selling to and your product to match, make them match. I'm going to jump through a few of these to a few examples. This place, uh, this, this guy set up a lodge, did a standard commercial lease, but in a rural area on a ranch to set up his quail hunting business and is, is doing a number of things besides quail hunting. Look at kayaking operations, and here I just want to highlight he was talking about being a guide and the value hosting these experiences. A lot of people think they should like nature, but they don't know how to experience it. So you really need a true quality guide, one that doesn't can deal with the audiences that you're targeting. And so that's one of the reasons we have this, trying to uh, expand the guide training. Uh, historical blend, you know, took an old house that was going to be destroyed in a road project, brought it to the ranch and restored it as a three-bedroom guest house, 700-acre um, place uh, under conservation and wildlife and, uh, you know, growing slow, slowly bit by bit and doing well now. Uh, Messina Hoff, uh, Aggie Land Winery, vineyards have grown big. What I highlighted here is they're doing a lot of creative things. Zombie Town movie night, murder mystery dinners, all kinds of things to tie into other promotional events. And y'all can do that too. Making it socially relevant to different audiences. This is a ranch, Sila Bamberger Ranch on Facebook. Uh, what's interesting, I was going to do prices here. They're selling the whole process that you're involved in, stewardship, restoration. People can be interested in that. In fact, They'll pay $115 a day to come learn about stewardship, and they'll pay $19 to come look at the fall colors. So uh, when you have expertise and value, it's there. Um, and there's a lot of new landowners that, you know, we get calls in extension a lot of, how do I make a living off my five acres with livestock? Well, you don't, so um, you do it some other way. <laughs> well, it depends on what kind of living you want. but. So what I get to here, I like, future ain't what it used to be. Yogi Berra does a lot of these good things. And so there's a lot of changes and new opportunities that weren't there. And I'm going to kind of finish up quickly with a few of these questions so you know why you bothered to have that thing in your hand. But I want to highlight a brand new, really exciting project called Long Acres Ranch Nature Tourism Center. And uh, this... is actually where I came from this morning. Um, so if you're familiar with the extension, you know, one of the things that extension is known as agriculture, but it's much more than that. But it's testing and, and finding out what works and what conditions locally. And so we have, we have crops that are tested, test plots, farms all over the state, and they test what grows under what conditions, with what fertilizers, with what pesticides. We do that with livestock different breeds, different, different, all kinds of different scenarios to, to let people know and see what works for them. And we tr then do demonstrations and training on those programs. And we do that in other avenues too. But in, with nature tourism, this title or, or is a, an agritourism, it's relatively new. 
There's no such thing, uh, essentially, until now. I am now, uh, through a private foundation, private landowner, I'm now setting up the Long Acres Ranch Nature Tourism Center as a research and demonstration center for nature tourism, outdoor recreation enterprises. It's in Richmond, Texas. It's a little under 800 acres on the Brazos River. And we'll be open to the public as a business for them to recreate, but we're open inviting researchers to get feedback, and we're doing a lot of free youth programming. So if you're involved with youth, we're scouts, new 4-H programs. And a big thing is paddling programs and wildlife photography, and hopefully a youth archery hunt um, for deer. But uh, <clears throat> there's a lot going to be happening. We're building facilities now. Uh, cattle were moved off in May, and uh, so now we have to uh, do our grassland restoration and some tree plantings and, and a number of things. Uh, just a few photos from outside my office window. Um, a very basic website up right now, longacresranch.tamu.edu. Uh, I'll kind of skip this, but I've got an initial six-year contract. Hopefully, it'll be renewed. Uh, but this is a permanent project, whether I stay involved or not after six years. Um, the foundation that, that owns this is investing a lot in this. It's dear to the, their interest, in really nature, to get more people exposed to nature. It's, uh, it's just on the Brazos River south of Richmond, which is just two miles north of 59 on Williams Way, if, if you know that area. Uh, I highlight you know, the distance to the mothership um, for everyone there. It's kind of an overview of the ranch. It's essentially everything inside that bend of the river. And we're dealing with you know, housing developments here. This will probably be all developed within the year. And so we've got a ranch on the other side, about 2,000 acres. But other than that, you know, we're in a suburb, basically. This is a half-mile sandbar when it's low. What's the river? The Brazos River. Um, there's two. Uh, we've got a two-bedroom house that will be available for uh, volunteers, students, researchers, and so on in a bit. Um, this is a historical house. My office is in this old servant's house. And uh, just a few of the things we want to do, um, and we're open for other things, but we have a couple core things, which is hike, guide, guided experiences, really guide training, but guided walks, wildlife photography, a lot of paddling, and, and groups coming in to do events, kind of campfire events. We'll have a riverside uh, campground for kayaking to do multi-day trips down the Brazos with existing landings, and we're working with the uh, Fort Bend Green and others on the, the whole paddling corridor effort and recreation effort on the Brazos and Fort Bend County. So that there's a lot happening. Um, Fort Bend County Extension has some new folks. There's a big transition, but we're, we're working with them, with the Master Naturalists, Master Gardeners, and the 4-H to do more natural resource programming. We had the Wildlife Habitat Evaluation Test Contest out there in January. Technically, we're not open yet. It's going to be a year before we're open. Um, I've got uh, two hours left, you said? Is that what that meant? OK. Uh, <laughs> well, well, I will need to tie you in. Uh, we're, we're, it's, we want to, well, we won't get into too much. But that's kind of from the master plan done with National Park Service for the county on the river corridor. I'm just kind of showing where, where we're sitting. Um, but this is what I want to highlight. What we want to do is basically allow more product testing to show how what works and what conditions and, sh and train other people to be successful. So experimental design, implementation of ecotourism, outdoor recreation experience and interpretation. So when is a guide economic give you a good return? Does it give you better education? Does it engage people more? When, when do unguided experiences work better? How do you engage diverse audiences? We're dealing, we've got exposure to millions of people in this location of all kinds of backgrounds. So it's really important. So you know, do we need a Hispanic guy or a black guide or an Indian guide to attract those markets? Or a woman or a man or old or young? What do we need? How does it work? What does it change? I want to be able to, to offer those experiments and invite researchers in any capacity. The wildlife, how does the wildlife respond? So on. Um, <clears throat> Market demand, what are the prices, how they fit in, and some of these environmental services we may or may not take advantage of, but we want to eva evaluate them. And uh, you know, what's the highest price 
experience. So we're going to be looking at what, how much money can you possibly get for these experiences and how does it go invest to supporting conservation on the property so that the operation can continue. Uh, we don't have enough funding, even with the generous funding from the foundation, to hire more than my program coordinator. So to hire guides and staff, we're going to have to have some revenue or additional donors. But I wanted to do it through, through, uh, through revenue so we can show the model. So uh, this is Mr. Kidda. If you want to visit um, as a representative of your organization, you're welcome to contact him and schedule a visit. Just wait at least a month, though. We're building an equipment barn and doing a bunch of things, and he's busy. Uh, we've had, now you can't see that, but we've already had a number of student groups and other projects done. You know, got an initial wildlife management plan, grass restoration plan, so, and this is the entrance. This, this berm there is the levee, so the, our property is everything on the other side of the levee. And just a few pictures from the place. A lot of sand. It's kind of nice. <laughs> this is the most attractive feature of the place. I mean, this is what people like. You know what this is? Yes. Butcher bird. It's the result of a butcher bird or a loggerhead shrike storing their food for later. A little. <laughs> so using that barbed wire fence for another purpose. Uh, we got this. Scouts. We've had 400 scouts camp out. Um, in the fall, we've got over 30 kayaks available now. 